the Minister of Environmental Affairs and a number of other stakeholders. So without further ado, let's hand it over to Peter and Dora. Peter, a very good morning to you once again. Ayanda, thank you very much indeed, and a very warm welcome to everybody who's watching uh, from uh, across the country and indeed across the continent on Channel 404 and DSTV. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, this is the scene for the latest in the series of New Age Business Briefings brought to you by the SABC and today very kindly sponsored uh, by Transnet. And we're talking today very importantly uh, about climate change, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon footprints. You've heard all these terms before. For, but what do they mean? How do they affect us? And what contribution are we making? And what can we all do uh, to mitigate uh, the, the effects of these issues? Well, uh, so we'll be taking a look uh, as, I guess, a, a, a holding point for this conversation, the outcomes of the international climate change uh, talks that took place in Paris, uh, COP21 it was called, and uh, South Africa was part of a, a, a group that went there to a sign an historic agreement. And the question is, how historic was it? How important was it? And uh, was it a game changer? Uh, the uh, climate change conference which took place uh, in the second week of December. Uh, and we're asking you, or in fact, we're hoping that you'll uh, get a better understanding of why it was important. But part of that conversation is um, some statistics that have come out. World Meteorological Organization says that the globe, average global surface temperature in 2015 was the hottest ever recorded in human history. And it reached uh, past the symbolic and significant milestone of one degree Celsius above the pre-industrial uh, era. Uh, and this was due to a combination of uh, facts, uh, the El Nino weather system and human-induced global warming. And that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, because at least we can do something about that. And uh, the period between 2011 and 2015 is the warmest five-year period on record. And we're seeing some of these effects, particularly here in South Africa, where we've seen the worst drought, I think, since 1992. And around the world, you'll see um, snowstorms and all kinds of extreme weather uh, patterns uh, playing out. But let's explore that, and to help us with that conversation, it's my great pleasure to welcome my panel, uh, starting with the Minister of Environmental Affairs, uh, the Honourable Edna Malewa. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Peter, and thanks for having us. All right, we look forward to hearing about uh, your uh, successes uh, in Paris shortly. Uh, but a man who's uh, under pressure at the moment to try and help our farmers is the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, uh, the Honourable Senzeni Zakwana. Thank you very much for joining us, and welcome to the programme. Uh, next to you, uh, Deputy Minister of Environmental Affairs, and uh, hopefully you're going to take us through, I think, a lot of the things that we can do locally uh, in our communities uh, to mitigate uh, uh, the, the effects of, uh, this, uh, of uh, global warming. Uh, the, the Honourable Barbara Thompson, thank you very much indeed, Deputy Minister, for joining us. And uh, from the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, but also an immediate past chair of the G77, uh, Ambassador uh, Maklakato Disebo, thank you very much for joining us and uh, welcome. And uh, we look forward to hearing your uh, thoughts and contributions about this global effort uh, and cooperation between countries in dealing with some of these issues. But let me start with you, uh, Minister Maloa. Um, people say that Paris was historic. Um, I remember COP17 in Durban, and for a number of COPs since then, where they started with so much hope, so much promise, but people always felt like we hadn't quite delivered. Was Paris different? Thank you very much for that question, Peter. Mm. Indeed, uh, Paris was different. Let me start by just contextualizing this issue. The world had to ensure that we fight climate change and together, with no country being left behind. And since the processes and the negotiations from Bali times uh, through to Copenhagen, through to Mexico, South Africa, you name all those processes, all that was happening during those negotiations was for all of us as, as world, people of the world, governments, NGOs, and so forth, working towards a unified system 
a unified agreement which we will all implement because being prolif proliferated and each one of us doing whatever you want or acting from a different corner and so forth, we realized that we wouldn't make any difference. So the processes went on in negotiations. Many people were saying, but what are these people doing? <laughs> COP 5, COP 7, COP 21, up to 21. The reality of the matter is that these negotiations were not easy. Parties were negotiating to exactly get to the point where we are, which we got to in uh, Paris last year. Mm -hmm. Now we have one agreement that the whole world is, being, is implementing. Of course we must say that. Mm -hmm. That process actually was born here, on South African soil, on the African soil. The decision to work out and to work out this agreement, which is a one agreement that is applicable to all, that's fair, that's ambitious, that's legally binding, was taken from here, here in South Africa. And since then, there's been a period of about four years of negotiations. Let's also say that each and every step of the way, whether we were in Warsaw, whether we were in, in, in here on the continent, in the Arab world, we have actually been walking the talk and doing a bit of a step forward, knowing very well that we've got to eat this elephant in chunks and now finish it in Paris. But yes, Paris has not concluded. It's very significant. It started here, and that was a groundbreaking deal, which we're all proud of. But it's a beginning of the work mm. that still needs to be done. As we said in Paris, that that Nelson Mandela did say that many, many more hills still lie ahead. All right, we're going to unpack some of the <laughs> things that were uh, agreed in Paris and uh, what it means in terms of our commitments and uh, steps going forward uh, as the conversation unfolds. Uh, but Minister Zokwana, um, and I guess one of the effects of uh, these weather systems and our contributions to um, uh, human-induced uh, greenhouse gases and so on and so forth are these extreme weather patterns that we're seeing. And our farmers at the moment, worst drought since 1992, if I'm not mistaken. How is something like the agreements signed in Paris going to help and change perhaps the complexion of dealing with agriculture uh, going forward? Thanks. I think I would like first to thank the, the delegation from South Africa led by the capable minister Edna Mulewa that came to these conclusions. As a department, we believe that the, the, this process of COP21 has also opened our eyes as it means now that we have to do things differently. The way we plant, the way we till, the way we do all the things we do has to make sure that we are we are always conscious of the fact that we have to mitigate. We have to do all these things to make sure that we are smarter in the way we, we use the land. We are smarter in the way we make sure that our forests are, 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 are supported and we grow more trees to make sure that we can be able to expand the capacity of trees mm -hmm. to, to release uh, oxygen and absorb carbon dioxide. We need to leave those things because it happens at a time when we're faced with the worst uh, disaster in terms of the current drought. But I believe that as farmers we can reduce even the usage of, 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 of diesel by applying this, uh, uh, the no-till systems so that we're able to make sure that we can produce at the rate, but training and supporting mm -hmm. our small-scale farmers. And I think the, the, the report therefore brings that, that there are things that the, 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 the COP21 agreed upon that needs to be done to assist the developing countries. But I think as a country, we must make sure that we use water, we change the forms of irrigation we have been using, and go to systems like the drip system. And we need to, to make sure that we change the times at which we have to irrigate. But I think that as a country, we need to make sure that this is not an event. It must be a process that leads to us being better uh, to make sure that food security is guaranteed to our people. And that we can do that by looking at these rules and everybody playing his role. And I would say mm -hmm. that I, as a department, we, we believe that we have got the, 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 the standards we have set up. So okay. we have to make sure that we go out to people and make sure that that's what we are, what we are doing. 
Scorer. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we'll again, we'll unpack uh, some of the issues, particularly in the agricultural sector as the conversation continues. But you talked about um, what ordinary people can do and their contributions. And uh, Minister, Deputy Minister uh, uh, Thompson, I I'd like to just get your first thoughts because, you know, a lot of these uh, talks <coughs> we see, uh, I think there was something like 150 heads of state that gathered in, in, in Paris, and it seemed like such a high level, these agreements are on a high level, COP21, this agreement, what, what framework, uh, and I'm sitting in a rural area somewhere in Limpopo and wondering, what has this got to do with me? How can I contribute? Perhaps if you could just give us some thoughts of how we can make this real and very local uh, um, uh, conversation. Uh, thank you very much, and I think you are quite correct, sitting there in Paris at a very high level, mm -hmm. and an ordinary Mazondi there in the rural area really doesn't understand what mm -hmm. is going on, how they could be affected, how they could also contribute in making sure that emissions are, are lowered. As much as we all know that natural causes <coughs> are a main contributor, but we also need to fully understand that industrial practices are also big contributors. And we now sit with this challenge of trying to balance economic development on the one hand, yes, we do need it, but at the same time, we need to make sure that as government, as people, as industry, mm -hmm. we work against um, the triple bottom line so as to benefit our people. Because in all what we do, we have to make sure that we are closing the gap between the rich and the poor. In other words, we are closing the gap of inequality, make sure that we are creating jobs, make sure that we are addressing the issue of unemployment. But also I want to say that climate change can also come with opportunities for our people. So we should not just look at it with a negative eye. It can offer opportunities in terms of renewable energy, in the form of your wind, your hydro, your solar. So our people can be part okay. of the whole process. All, right. All is not bad. <laughs> okay, so many opportunities is, is, uh, to, to, to explore. And I, 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 later on, I hope we can explore as well. Um, I remember uh, spending time on my grandfather's homestead in the rural areas, and it just seems that Historically, uh, as a people, we had a sense of mm. our environment and how to do things, and perhaps we've lost that over the years. Maybe we can try and find a way to reconnect with our own mm. histories and cultures, but that's a conversation we'll have. Um, Ambassador, your job was enormous. You know, we talk about the G77 plus China, and uh, going to Paris just ahead of that. Uh, I remember you said uh, you had some concerns about the draft UN Accord on fighting climate change and you described it as a form of apartheid against developing nations. <laughs> Is that not true? <laughs> so you're misquoted. <laughs> but, but, but I think what it does point to was the challenge that having so many players together to come to a final agreement that everybody can come, agree with I get a sense that developing nations have an agenda, um, developed nations had an agenda. It must have been an enormous task to get to that point. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. It is a pity that um, our media does not follow consistently mm. Mm. and in-depth issues. I think this is the point that Mohsin was mm. doing. 
So they will pick up a story mm -hmm. and not investigate it in depth. Mm -hmm. And before you know where you are, there is an accusative right. headline right. that is not anchored in any mm -hmm. uh, story. I'll come back to that okay. and answer it in full. I just want to re-emphasize what Minister Mulewa was saying, um, that if it hadn't been for Durban, mm -hmm. if it had not been for COP17, there would not have been an agreement mm -hmm. in Paris. Mm -hmm. The whole structure would have sunk. So it all began in Durban on the basis of the Durban Platform for Enhanced um, uh, uh, Action. At that point, we'd reached the crossroads in a context where how we understand climate change is that it didn't happen yesterday. It has been happening since the Industrial Revolution, the first. And the understanding is that because of that, those that two policies that have led us to where we are, which is developed countries, must take the lead in a legally binding way to compensate us for the hardships that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. While a woman in Limpopo might not know the discourse on the lingo of climate change, they feel it, mm -hmm. they live it, they have to deal with it on a daily uh, uh, basis. So for competitive reasons, and domestic national interest region, reasons, when developed countries suddenly realize that developed countries, developing countries were doing well, they turned around and said, no, no, we cannot continue doing what we do because what you do to address climate change has a, an impact on your ability to create jobs an impact on your ability to address income inequalities, an impact on your ability to export, an impact on your society. They turned around and said, no, we cannot any longer carry the burden that we should carry. And they threw the system out of kilter. There were calls for a new agreement in a context where there is a primary agreement, the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the question was about who does what? Mm. Because what you do has an immediate impact on the options and the policy choices uh, that you have. South Africa is a developing country, an African country, that has a legacy of poverty which articulates itself on racial lines. And we negotiate as such. So any agreement mm. that must have Africa and the developing world as part of, has to take their interests into account. Mm. Mostly we have to adapt. We're dealing with the challenge of adapting unpredictable impacts of climate change, like the drought that we have. So a primary, primary thing that we have to do is to be constantly adapting, finding ways in which we protect ourselves. Yet alone, there's nothing South Africa can do to defend itself against climate change. We all have to uh, uh, together. So when we arrived in the final stage of the negotiations, these guys came with an agreement that suited them mm. and were locking all of us out. Mm. We were supposed to undertake responsibilities that would immediately have an, an impact on our competitiveness, while they would walk away without any obligations whatsoever. We need the international rule of law. We need to all take responsibilities and know, I need to know what the US is going to do. For South Africa, we need to know what the European Union is going to do for predictability. But there must be a rule of law so that nobody wakes up and says, South Africa is not doing enough on climate change, mm -hmm. therefore we will not allow your imports to come into our country. Right. So it was those things that we were talking about. My Gratitude in being here is that I'm hoping, Minister, this is the first of a series yeah. of discussions that we will have to unpack the climate agreement, to understand what its impact is going to be on women, what its impact is going to be on the private sector that creates jobs, right. what its impact is going to be on labor, what its impact is going to be sectorally on agriculture and all of that, rather than these like odd reports you get in either Mail and Guardian, yes. or it's like they woke up and realized there's something happening, oh, where do we get a quote or a sound bite? Mm -hmm. That this is very important. 
We need to understand it. South Africans have to understand it in totality. Right. And the gift that the new uh, age gives us is the platform to begin to do that. Well, we'll mm -hmm. continue with that conversation Definitely. right after this. So stay with us. Don't forget, at Morning Live SABC is our Twitter handle, hashtag TNA Biz Brief. Start posing your questions, your suggestions, contributions on those platforms, and we'll get responses from you from our panelists right after this. Stay with us. Thank you.